You won't b- 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 believe your ears. Hello, I'm your host, David Aronovich. I'm thrilled to have with me today Josh Glancy, special correspondent at the Sunday Times. The topic we'll be discussing today is the impact of artificial intelligence on our society. Will AI bring about unprecedented advancements that improve our lives? Or will it be the downfall of humanity, leaving us either extinct or in a dehumanized world? Let's get started on the ethics of AI. Let's stop there. The voice you just heard wasn't me. The words you just heard weren't mine. The truth is, it was written and read by artificial intelligence. Let me explain. First, one of our producers had a conversation with ChatGPT, a chatbot created by the company OpenAI. We told ChatGPT what this episode was about, asked it to write an introduction, and it did so in seconds. The voice, a synthesised clone of me, was created in our editing app, Descript. We trained it on over a dozen recordings of my voice from past episodes. So, this is David recording the Lord Frost script for James. This is David recording the Xi Jinping the script. libel script for Sam. The uh, Politics Economics script. Afghan Interpreter 2. We're revisiting some of the episodes. Tell me that you shared the French court. We all watched the news. We've not seen the news. We've been listening to the stories of our times with me, David Aronovich, and my guests. Can somebody shut the dog up? I had to read a short consent statement, and then Aeronobot was born. So, uh, you haven't heard it, we haven't heard it. This is what the AI wants to say to introduce itself. Hello, David. I am an AI version of your voice, created using advanced technology. It's nice to finally meet you. <laughs> oh, my God, that is much closer to my voice than I expected it to be. It sounds enough like me right now for somebody who, even somebody who knows me, to think it is me. I am a bit discombobulated by that. Kill it! Kill it now! (laughs) Let's agree three things here. First, that was quite fun. Even if chat GPT doesn't really capture my puckish sense of humour... And I would never say I was thrilled to do anything. I'm not some cliche-ridden daytime TV presenter. Second, it does show how quickly AI is advancing. And third, well, is it also a bit scary? So um, with superhuman AI, there's a particular risk, which is that, well, it could kill everyone. That's a researcher from Oxford University speaking to MPs recently. And the concern is not new. The development of artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. I think the danger of AI is much greater than the the danger of nuclear warheads. By a lot. But there is the other side. There are almost incalculable benefits from these new technologies. AI is enabling us to develop cancer therapy that is specifically tailored to the individual patient. Delivering high quality education to you know, everybody on earth, it's just the beginning. The coming era for AI will empower everyone to build AI systems for themselves. That will be an incredibly exciting future. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm the living, breathing human David Aronovich. Today, artificial intelligence, a bright new future or the end of humanity. I'm Josh Glancy. I am special correspondent for The Sunday Times. I try to take on big themes in society and and look at them in depth. Do you ever do small themes? Well, I also did a piece about my gas bills and why is the government paying them? (laughs) So that's quite... (laughs) Involved me posing in my boxer shorts, so... (laughs) I was going to say, I did see that, I have to say. (laughs) Um, We'll 
get to the big picture in a moment, uh, Josh, uh, and talk about AI more generally. But first, let's begin at a wine tasting. Well, if you imagine you're at a, you're in Trinity College, Oxford, a very leafy and venerable place, and you're in a common room with about 30 philosophers, and there are three tables of wine laid out. And a guy called Barry Smith, who's actually a philosophy professor in London, but also a great bon viveur and wine expert, was giving us a talk. And he asked us to try the different wines. And the reason this is relevant to artificial intelligence is because these are all three wines that would have been recommended by a wine recommendation app, such as Vivino or Delectable. We did a blind tasting. He asked us which wines we preferred. They're all Sauvignon Blancs. And everyone preferred number two, almost the whole room. But if the wine app was telling us which wines to drink, it would have sent us from number one, which was a cheapo wine, to number three, skipping number two, even though on balance, number two was the best wine. And the reason for that is its algorithm has a bias towards bigger brands, bigger names, very slightly more expensive wines because it's always trying to upsell you. It doesn't send you towards the maybe slightly more interesting, slightly more offbeat wine. And so this was a rather sort of fun and boozy way to demonstrate what these recommendation algorithms, which most of us use all the time now, Netflix, Spotify, Vivino, whatever it is, are warping our taste and they're changing the way we consume things. So who was actually running this occasion? It was a day-long seminar being run by something called the Ethics of AI Institute, which is a new institute that's been founded at Oxford. So there's this guy, John Tazoulas, who runs it, and he's hired all these philosophers, and they are all there sort of stroking their chins and drinking lots of Sauvignon Blanc. And at the core of its mission is to assess AI. What does it mean for humanity? Okay, now we're going to come on to the bit of the interview which you should rightly fear because we're in what's being called the golden age of AI and I think everybody agrees that things have developed quickly over the last few years but there are some term definitions need to be doing here. So firstly, Josh, sorry to do this to you, what actually is AI? Well, it's a good question because a lot of things get thrown into the AI basket. The definition is quite simple in a way. It is human style intelligence done by a machine. So AI is is an algorithm or group of algorithms that that can perform tasks that we would normally think of as as human, say speech recognition or facial recognition or the translation of language, and it uses an artificial form of intelligence to do that. So it can perceive information and then it can synthesize it. It can even make inferences. So if you think about in our everyday lives, that could be Siri. It could also be Netflix saying, you like this, maybe you'll like that. Could be Spotify, it could be Amazon telling you what to buy. So artificial intelligence is already absolutely woven into our lives. But what's happening is that it's the speed and scale and quality of what they're able to do is massively accelerating, particularly in the last couple of years. So we're now getting these chatbots that can scan half the internet in a minute and give you an answer to, I don't know, what caused the Spanish Civil War or something. It can generate a photo. If you see, you know, in in my piece, we had Henry VIII eating a hot dog. A human probably could do that still, but, you know, it's doing it instantly. So we're at this slight tipping point where we're starting to get what we call generative AI that can sort of create things itself. And that's really got a lot of people excited, but it's also got a lot of people worried. So generative AI is essentially a program or a series of programs which actually generates its own content. Absolutely. So if you were pitching to Silicon Valley venture capital firms right now, that is the buzzword of the year, generative AI. Generative AI can make its own music. It can write poems. It can pass medical exams or bar exams. So it can do a lot. (laughs) And it's really only just at its inception. So it's obviously going to get better. Let's talk about the one that everybody's talking about at the moment, which is ChatGPT. Just remind those who've been living on Mars what ChatGPT is and what it does. ChatGPT3 is the latest chatbot that's been released by OpenAI, which is probably among the top two or three AI companies in the world. Our mission is to create highly capable AI technologies and deploy them to the world for the benefit of humanity. And... 
a chatbot basically you as a human can input information so you could ask it can you summarize the theory of evolution for me and it can do it and what it does is it has access to an enormous amount of information all of wikipedia for example and then it can synthesize it and then it can write an answer for you it's not exactly a human answer but it's pretty darn close jeremy hunt used chat gpt for part of a speech on the economy from the way we communicate and collaborate to the way we buy and sell goods and services digital technology has transformed nearly every aspect of our economic lives how do i know that because I too, just like Matt, asked ChatGPT to craft the opening lines <laughs> of this speech. And who needs politicians when you've got AI? To me, it often reads a bit like a sort of 16-year-old's essay. It's written in quite simple language. It doesn't have a lot of humor or great insight. Sorry about, sorry, I don't mean to indulge any 16-year-olds. But it can, it's very informative. It's fairly accurate. And it's got a lot of people excited. So universities are really banning it because people immediately think, well, this is the end of the undergraduate essay. You know, why write a hungover 2000 words when you can just ask the chat GPT to do it? Will it replace the writing of news articles? So it's a whole can of worms, basically, that it's opened up. You talked earlier about it passing bar and medical licensing exams. I mean, is that true or is that just a, an apocryphal story? It has been claimed. I, it's not good at maths. Sometimes it says stuff that's completely untrue. Like it doesn't have a very good radar for truth and, and falsehood. But if you think about something like a bar exam, it's not necessarily an act of great literature. It's really about how many cases can you remember and can you bring all this information to bear under pressure in a short space of time? Well, I think it's pretty quite good at doing that sort of thing. And it does it incredibly quickly. Yeah, doesn't I mean, it? almost it's almost instant. Should we be worried that? not maybe chat GPT three, maybe not four, but five, six or seven is going to take our jobs. Yes, I think so. If you look at OpenAI, their core plan as a company is to create artificial general intelligence that does the bulk of human labor. It's on their website. I think that AI will be a technological revolution on the scale of the agricultural, the industrial, the computer revolution. And we have no goal other than the creation and deployment of safe beneficial AGI. We have a non-profit that is a massive goal that would utterly transform human life as we know it. So I think we need to take that very seriously and think, is this something we want? We are playing with dynamite here. Let's talk about some of the coolest stuff for a moment before we get mm. on to some of the problems. Mm. I wrote a big article about three years ago about the use of AI in medical diagnostics. They're already using it, let's say, at Moorfields to look at retinas, etc. The machine actually gives you an instant answer at the highest diagnostic level of a human diagnostician who is absolutely consistently good. Yes. Medical diagnosis is probably the single best use case we have for AI at the moment. Because let's be honest, could be a robot, could be a monkey, could be a human, don't care, just want the best answer we can get, right? I mean, there are implications for having a robot do it, not a human. Often accountability comes up. If something makes a mistake, does it matter that it's a human or a machine? But fundamentally, I think even doctors would say to you, look, if it can be more accurate than me, as long as we've got the right safeguards in place, let's do it. And they are forging ahead with that. I met a radiologist who was saying what he hopes AI will be able to do is not just find the cancer, but say it was in your lungs, it might be able to say, well, how much of your tissue would we have to cut away if we operated on it? And what would the effects on your lungs be? And how much of your lung capacity would you lose? Mm. So it can start doing what this kind of almost overarching analysis of the whole process. Very exciting. What about courts of law? where a case might need a more objective assessment than, say, maybe human beings give it? Court of law is a really interesting one. It's very conceivable that we could build a robot that has the ability to draw on an enormous amount of case material. The whole history of law it could draw on in an instant. It wouldn't necessarily have subjective biases about people, what skin color they are, what gender they are. It would never tire. And we've got the enormous backlog in our crown courts at the moment. Tens of thousands of cases not being heard because there aren't enough trained judges. Well, it would be a really good way of addressing that. So there's a lot of potential upsides, but this is really much more ethically challenging than the cancer diagnosis because we have a jury system in this country. The idea of being judged by your peers is very important. A judge in this country will always explain why they have come to the decision they've come to. And that's very important for the people that lose the case so that they have some sort of proper explanation. 
Sometimes you can then appeal based on that explanation. And so I think the robot judge is going to be a really hard thing to justify. But there are other ways you could do it. You could have a robot mediator, an AI that you say, before you go into courtroom, let's try the AI mediator. We agree to use it, see what it says. So there are potentially ways you could integrate it into the law without necessarily replacing a judge. Josh, what about freeing people from the drudgery of manual labour and horrible chores? Yeah, so this is a really interesting one. Sam Altman, who's the head of OpenAI, said recently, for a long time, we thought AI was going to replace blue collar jobs first, manual jobs. He now thinks that it's actually really coming for white collar jobs first. But clearly, there are certain manual jobs so that it can do really well. I think the best example of this is the Roomba or the, the robot vacuum cleaner. I don't know a single person in the world that would be sad to stop vacuum cleaning. And it has huge potential benefits. So in this country, I think domestic labor is still done about 60% by women. In a country like Japan, more patriarchal, that's more like 90%. So freeing humanity from that would have a significant impact on gender inequality. So that has, I think, quite a lot of potential upside too. We've talked through, Josh, some of the positives there. So let's now talk about some of the concerns that your Oxford philosophers have. They have said to MPs, haven't they, given evidence that they think AI should be regulated like nuclear weapons because actually it could be a great big threat to us. Take us through what they said and then we'll come to why they said it. Yeah, so there's an array of different focuses on this AI point. Some people really focus on this idea of AI apocalypse, basically a robot takeover. Because if we reach what's known as artificial general intelligence, the point where the AI can match and actually exceed human capacity, and is then able to keep making itself more intelligent, so what they call super intelligence, well, that potentially gets quite scary quite quickly, right? But you might also have a super intelligence that just doesn't know when to stop what it's doing. So the famous example is what's known as the paperclip example. So you create a super, super intelligent AI and say to it, can you just make paperclips? fine. But the AI then decides that it really likes making paperclips and doesn't want to stop. And it's just going to keep using whatever material it can get get to hand to make paperclips. And it could just destroy the human race just to make more paperclips. (sighs) So that's something that a lot of people are very worried about in the AI community. The Ethics Institute is much more focused on the near term. It's much more focused not on will AI kill us, but how should we live with it? And how should we design it so that we remain flourishing, human, as happy as possible people, and not sort of ruled by what they call an algocracy. Okay, that's very interesting. So we're looking at two things here. Some people might say they are actually linked. The one is actually mad AI takes over and like the sorcerer's apprentice, we've invoked something that we can't stop millions of paperclips. And the other one is the ethical questions of dealing with it on a day-by-day basis and its effect on us. Okay, those are the distinctions, right? Mm. And this being Oxford, the, the two groups don't really like each other. I should have had <laughs> say. Okay. Well, AI philosophers, of course, wouldn't have that problem because that issue wouldn't arise between them, not if you're told <laughs> yes, it not to. that's a very human issue. So AI could be enormously helpful or incredibly harmful, but who are the people giving it some critical thought? Let's go back and meet one of our wine-tasting philosophers, the man who runs Oxford's Institute for Ethics in AI, Professor John Tazoulis. AI prompts real reflection on what's distinctive about humans, and one of them is the capacity for rational self-direction. And Mm -hmm. I think there is something about a deep human need to exercise that. John got me into this subject. And he's a really interesting guy. He's an Australian by birth, Greek Australian, grew up in Melbourne, blue collar background, very successful legal philosopher. And he is the director of this Ethics of AI Institute. On a cynical view, ethics is a matter of facile mottos like don't be evil. But that is not at all how we understand ethics in the Institute. He's quite a robust, sort of punchy man and has quite heterodox opinions. For us, ethics refers to the ultimate values that human beings should respect and pursue. Values like justice, equality 
and the common good. We went for a very long tea in the, the common room at Balliol College, which is where he's centred. And he just, you know, you, every once in a while you have those conversations in your life and you're just riveted by what someone's saying. It's like they're synthesising all these half-formed thoughts in your head. And he just came out and said it to me in sort of perfectly formed philosophical English. So Josh, this ethics group is funded by a billionaire. You met him in Manhattan a few years back, I think. Tell us about him. Steve Schwartzman is the head of Blackstone, which I think is the world's largest private equity firm. He's been enormously successful. He's worth 20-odd billion. 20 billion? Yeah, he's seriously rich. He's very politically involved, leans towards the Republicans. He's a thoughtful guy. I don't think about philanthropy the way you would expect me to. I look at solving uh, big issues, addressing big issues, uh, starting new organizations to do it, much like we do in our business. You know, grew up in a sort of lower middle class Jewish family, has sort of made it all himself. And I interviewed him about his book. You know, all these billionaires write books telling everyone else how to be as successful as they are. I interviewed him in the boardroom at Blackstone on Park Avenue in Manhattan. He had just given the gift to Oxford, this huge 150 million plus gift to build a new humanities institute. And he said, look, I'd previously just given $350 million to MIT in Massachusetts. And that was for their computer science program. Uh, And he said, I realized that I wanted to almost balance it out. I wanted to give something to the humanities because I don't just want us to make these advances. I want us to think about them. I can see the need to have control of these types of technologies. So when they're introduced, we don't create a mess like we did with the internet. He was wooed by Louise Richardson, the the vice chancellor of Oxford and others, and that's where the money ended up. I end up starting something new, marshalling people, and then at the end of that, somebody typically asked me to write a check. And so that's how this whole program began. Okay, so um, in a way, I think I understand what his motivation might be. Is it fair to put it a bit like this, Josh, which is, as we develop new technologies, we're not very good always at thinking about what the impacts upon us are going to be and about planning for them. Is that broadly it? Yeah, it all comes back for me to that that old motto, move fast and break things. And that is absolutely at the core of how Silicon Valley has operated from day one. Charge ahead, build what you can, and then we'll work it out later. You know, what does it mean for humanity? The argument from Oxford and others, which I totally buy, is we've got that the wrong way around. We should think about whether we should make it at all, how we should make it, what we should make. And these are ethical questions that programmers aren't really qualified to think about. Philosophers are. Oppenheimer famously said, I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Now I've become death, destroyer of worlds. He realized what the nuclear bomb would do. Now we found a way to live with nuclear weapons, but it may have been better for humanity had we not invented them in the first place. Do you think, as you look at this group of philosophers, that what they're doing will have any effect given the impetus that lies behind such technological advance? I think there's a danger that these things become talking shops. And philosophers love asking questions. that They don't really like giving answers. When you interview them, you ask them a question, then they ask you 10 back. But there are other universities doing this as well, of course. Stanford University is putting on boot camps for politicians because it's really important that our politicians understand a bit of this too so that they can ask vaguely competent questions in committee hearings and the like. It's important to democratize this. So they really want as many people as possible to know about it. And part of that, as John Tazoulis put it to me, he said he wants to see a cultural change a bit like we had around climate, where there's just this pervasive awareness of what the issues are and people are advocating around it. And we have a real sense that this is something that humanity needs to care about. I don't believe in silver bullets, but the closest thing for a silver bullet to me is subjecting AI technology to robust control by an informed democratic public. What did the ethicists say about the vexed question 
of whether or not machines actually can be as good as us at thinking and feeling. There's not a lot of agreement on that. But personally, I think the really subtle nuances of empathy, of humour, can't be replicated by a robot. I'm sure I'll be made to eat my words in 20 years time. <laughs> the thing is though, the mistake we sometimes make, it's called the AI fallacy, is to think that they're going to be clever in the way that we're clever. And actually what they're probably going to be is clever in ways that we don't really understand. So when AlphaGo, which is a deep mind creation, beat Lisa Doll, the world's best Go player about seven years ago, I wonder if we have a resignation here. It could be that Lisa Lowe has resigned. Yeah, Lee has. I, I'm getting word Lee has resigned. Big congratulations to the AlphaGo team. And this was a huge moment in the, the field of AI because Go is incredibly complex. And we thought that really only the human brain could master it. The interesting and scary thing was no one really understands how it beat him. Since AlphaGo teaches itself, it might be difficult to find out why these moves are being played. Mm -hmm. It has these kind of deep learning networks. You can't, as they say, look under the bonnet half the time. You don't actually know where it's getting its answers from. And Lisa Doll retired from Go because he felt that he had been replaced. Well, I guess I lost the game because I wasn't able to find out what the weakness is. So we may be able to replicate the human brain but we're also going to create artificial brains that operate quite differently. Let's look at the more kind of, if you like, everyday worries. Things like the jobs that we're doing and the decisions that we're making for ourselves. John's real concern is that we end up in this world where we just get a bit demoralised. A real threat, real possibility, is you live in a dehumanised world where decisions that affect you are taken by automated systems. You don't play an active role in the process of decision making. Mm. But this is so we get disempowered, we feel alienated because decisions are being made for us by technology that we don't properly understand, but it is sold to us as a way of filling our preferences. So we become these sorts of passive consumers, not really in control of our lives. And I think this is my deepest fear, that we could become alienated from our world, we're sort of demoralized into thinking that human action is futile or pointless or superseded by the existence of these structures. And he thinks that some of what's driving populism, some of what's driving conspiracy theories, is this sense people have that they're losing agency, that there are forces at work, whether they algorithms or the companies that make them, that, that are shaping their lives in ways that they don't understand. Let's go back to your wine for a moment. Um, <laughs> With pleasure. Because I've been thinking about the wine thing subtly while you've been speaking, although I have been paying attention. I was just thinking, if a wine algorithm comes up with a wine that I don't think is as good as another wine that I have had access to, then in that case, won't you go for wine from the Surprise Me wine company instead? <laughs> I'm sure that already exists. But fundamentally, humans are a bit lazy. Most of us will use the big famous app that does the obvious choices because it's easy and it's convenient and it's what we've heard of. So yeah, there might be the connoisseur might look for the Surprise Me app, but most of the rest of us will just go along the path of least resistance. And I think that's probably the danger. Thanks for tuning into The Ethics of AI. I want to thank Josh for joining me today and sharing his thoughts on AI ethics. Our conversation is just the beginning, so stay tuned for more discussions on this important topic. Until next time, this is David signing off. Just to be clear, that was fake me again. This is the real me. Honestly. You think you've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, David Aronovich, and my guest, Josh Glancy, special correspondent for The Sunday Times. You can find all of Josh's work at thetimes.co.uk or in print on Sundays. The producer was Olivia Case. The executive producers today were Kate Ford and James Shield. And sound design was by David Crackles. 
But if you have a story you think we should be covering, an idea for a future episode, or thoughts on what you've just heard, send us an email to storiesofourtimes at thetimes.co.uk. See you again soon. <laughs>